for our next speaker, um, who is Mark Bishop from National Trust in Scotland. And Mark has got a fantastic job title. He's Director of Customer and Cause, which I love. I think that's brilliant. Anyway, welcome to, um, welcome to you, Mark. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Just for those who can't see me, I'm a white male, early 50s with an 80s tuft of hair and a green T-shirt. Um, you may get uh, uh, unintended sound effects in this presentation in the sense of a dog. Possibly the washing machine may finish its cycle. And who knows, an Amazon delivery might buzz the door at any time. Um, I'm really delighted to be speaking to you for the next 10 minutes because I can see from um, the organisations on this session that there are you know, a very wide range of very important um, museums, galleries and charities um, out there. And notwithstanding the fact that we know we're living in difficult times in a kind of um, world sense, and we've all been through a, a hedge backwards in the last couple of years, I do think now is a really exciting crossroads point, as you've heard from the previous speakers. So I'm going to talk to you about National Trust for Scotland and give you a, a very brief case study of how we're addressing the hybrid um, issues from an internal perspective. So there's obviously an external dimension to that, which is our whole engagement model, but actually I'm going to talk to you about the inside, uh, the organisation implications. And I guess if there was a kind of summary of what I'm going to cover off in the next few minutes, it would be that purpose-led organisations, like the ones that we're all representing, who have hopefully motivated and very aligned employees, can really embrace um, a hybrid model more effectively, because we know we can trust our people to work without having to put them in the chicken, chicken pen of the office, if I'm going to put it like that. Um, but I think the challenge sometimes is getting to a shared culture across an organisation. And I would argue, and I, I'll, I'll talk about it in the next few minutes, that for us at the Trust, we do see face-to-face um, -face as an important part of the mix going forward. So I guess um, you heard me just say that, in a sense, we, um, in, in, in our, in our organisations, have almost an unfair advantage in terms of having teams who are driven by our shared sense of purpose in each of our organisations. And so that unfair advantage is something I think we can genuinely uh, build on when thinking about hybrid approach. Uh, a couple of health warnings about me. So I'm not an HR expert, uh, but I have worked in the voluntary sector for the last 20 or so years. And I'm one of the main directors at the National Trust of Scotland. I've been there for the last six years. So I've got a good sense of the kind of issues that we face as an organisation. The three things I just want to cover off is just giving you a sense of National Trust of Scotland's biggest issues pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, post because -pandemic, you'll find that there's kind of a, a journey we're on um, that's actually been accelerated by what we've been through in the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to outline for you very briefly the, uh, the hybrid guidance that we've just issued to our staff team in the last week, just to give you a sense of the, the key parameters to that and the thinking behind it. And then finally, I'm just going to talk about a few pros and cons of um, hybrid working from an organisational and an employee perspective. So um, National Trust for Scotland maybe needs not too much introduction, but just to kind of introduce the charity for those who are less familiar with our work. We would describe ourselves as Scotland's largest conservation charity. Um, we look after coast, coastlines to castles, art, architecture, wildlife to wilderness. So a very broad range of um, activities in Scotland. So I, I would describe us as very genre rich and uh, very broad in our geographic reach as well. So that, that issue that Zach was talking about, dispersed ways of working, would very much apply to us because we've got people and places right across Scotland. Um, our enduring challenge pre-pandemic was to kind of find a way to make sure that each of our properties and places um, dialed up their unique heritage um, sort of storytelling um, and interpretation, but that we introduce common, boring sort of systems and processes, all the finance stuff, the HR stuff, all those sorts of approval process, processes needed common sets of systems. So since 2018, we've put all of those systems um, in place. And I think what we were saying to ourselves just pre-pandemic was the biggest challenge therefore going forward was how do you build um, a shared sense of culture as an organization, uh, what we call a one trust mindset. So that everybody in the charity regardless of whether they're in a castle, a garden in the northeast, north, west, south and so forth, feel that they're part of the National Trust of Scotland first, rather than, you know, thinking specifically about their role, their property or very kind of local context, because it's that commonality that we're keen to build. 
And that's particularly the case now because we just launched um, our brand new 10 year strategy, Nature, Beauty, Heritage for Everyone. And that strategy is all about outward looking uh, public benefit, uh, but we're also considering how we go about achieving our 10 year objectives, not just what we're gonna do in those 10 years. So the hybrid guidance that we've just issued to our, our team uh, in the last couple of days has um, a few key kind of messages in it. Firstly, it's saying that some roles um, are eligible and some roles may not be eligible for hybrid working um, in the full sense. So if you're working, I know, at a castle um, as a visitor services uh, rep there, it's less easy for you to have the same level of hybrid flexibility than perhaps somebody in an office-based um, setting. We said for those who can work in a hybrid context that um, we would specify that 60% of your designated time would still be in your primary place of work, i.e. probably an office or a particular kind of property. So I'll come back to that 60% rule in a second. But therefore, 40% of your time would be on average spent working from home. That 60% in an office, your designated place of work, could be the office proper. It could be a regional hub office. It could be at a property setting, or in the case of many of my team, um, could be at a marketing partner um, office as well. Uh, I think actually the other day, Zach and I were having this conversation about the 60% stuff. And I think Zach was saying it kind of fills in with dread sometimes when he hears organisations saying they're going to mandate 60%. So let me kind of just give you a sense of why we've ended up with that as the, as the kind of uh, number. Um, the, challenge, the challenge is when thinking about... Um, uh, sort of tax issues and employee kind of rights and stuff like that. Um, if you say you, you don't have um, a designated place of work um, or it's left more fluid, I think the challenge would be that your employees could potentially be charging you travel expenses to travel from home to the office or anywhere else. So we've said actually the designated place of work is where you know, what your contract says, but in reality we're not going to be clock watching and monitoring people on a daily kind of basis. So it's a kind of stated average just to kind of navigate all the HR and employment law kind of um, parameters. Um, I think the plus side that we see from a hybrid model is, is the idea of simultaneous reach. I think one of the things I've noticed as a director before, when affecting change across the organisation, we would literally do road trips around the country just to get out to our properties and places and our people. Um, and that meant that you, you kind of, by, by the fact that you're physically travelling, couldn't be um, reaching everybody simultaneously. So you always had some people feeling that they were seen first and some people feeling they were seen last. That's overcome. You can now share to everybody a message on a simultaneous kind of basis. I also think it allows us to democratise trust because um, it allows us, rather than just saying more senior people can have a bit more flexibility in terms of their work arrangement, we're pushing that, that kind of flexibility through the organisation. So therefore more junior members of staff can also benefit from more flexible kind of ways of working. Um, that organisational culture, I think, is probably easier to build because of that simultaneous delivery. Uh, I think what will be more challenging is thinking about the individual team uh, culture, if people aren't coming together face to face. Um, I would also say that meetings on Teams and Zoom tend to be what, what I would see is very kind of um, task orientated. And so therefore, I'm not so clear on whether we're spending enough time on thinking about developing people and the softer side of kind of meetings. Um, and I think we all know that the issues around comfort breaks and whatever else, we're all bouncing from meeting to meeting, whereas sometimes in a physical context, you have physically got to travel between meetings. So you've got time for a cup of tea and a toilet break. And I think one of the things that we're going to have to think very carefully about the trust is issues of, of, of I don't know, possible resentment, if I use that word, between members of our teams who are in fixed locations and therefore have less flexibility versus the likes of me, who um, could actually have much more flexibility in terms of the hours I work, where I work and so forth. So we've got to think through what it looks like for different employees across the organization. But I guess my takeaway message for us would be um, that you know, it, it is important to embrace change. I would say for organizations that are embarking on a hybrid approach, um, don't set your, your, your plans in stone. Talk openly to your, your workforce and say, look, this is a new journey for all of us and let's keep it under constant review so that if you do need to kind of navigate changes, you have the ability to kind of make those changes rather than find yourself in a fixed position. Thank you.